The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network presents No Neutrality, where we have a roundtable of contributors pushing the antithesis in every area of life. From family to government, apologetics to homeschooling, being a wife and a mother, a husband, a father, single, widow, business owner, or employee, you will hear commentary, essays, lectures, blogs, and battle plans on how to bring forth the Christian worldview to all of life. Afternoon. We are in the middle of our uh, flooding up here, though it's probably not going to flood too much. But you've been following the hurricane, and we're sort of at the tail end of it out here in western North Carolina. But <clears throat> I had some things that I uh, wanted to share with you, so if you're interested, stay aboard. I got a text the other night from my oldest, uh, my second oldest son, my third oldest child, Josh, who said he woke up from a dream where he had been reading my book. I think some of you know about this. And he said the name of it was When Children Walked the Earth. I haven't written that book. So I asked him what it was that I had wrote. And he said he didn't know. He never remembered much about dreams. The next morning, I woke up and saw the book all at once. I managed to jot down the outline I had glimpsed. And I honestly can't remember if I did a Facebook Live on it or not. I meant to. <clears throat> and I promise you then that I would share anything else I could recall from that outline. Forgive me, you will not see a whole lot of proof texting. That too will come, but for this chapter, you do need to know Genesis 1 through 4 and some basic Christian doctrine. Now, the history of the human government, wherever it's been found, wherever people have governed each other, has been the story of the authoritarian supervision of elite leaders using force to control people who cannot imagine freedom apart from a leader who frees them by organizing them, controlling them, telling them what to do, and in many cases it grows to providing everything for them. Now, make no mistake, <clears throat> children need authoritarian supervision. There's nothing I'm going to say that says children are somehow springing from the womb, fully able to tell everybody what to do and how to live, though many of our children do seem to have sprung from the womb exactly like that. Now, the parent-child analogy, though, is always embraced by leaders who identify themselves as the elite parents and everyone else as their incompetent children. These elite leaders try to gain sympathy by whining about how hard it is to take care of your children. Uh, does that sound familiar? Most parents, at some point in their parenting, will whine in a similar way. This analogy, though, is only evil when it is taken by elitists to create permanent casts of elite controllers of the people and submissive, controlled, and competent people who need their benefactors, much the same way if their goal is complete, that they will have what the Chinese lords had when they were able to bind uh, their wives' feet starting at small childhood so that the wife had to be carried around. Indeed, when they tried to liberate women from this bondage, the women were first to be outraged because their very status was found in their helplessness. And that's sort of a pure picture of what happens when you have elites taking a legitimate analogy, namely adult child, uh, for one aspect of leadership and turning it into the controlling analogy, which keeps them perpetual children. Now, since the parent-child relationship has been the controlling metaphor of human government since Genesis 4, let's look at child rearing from the perspective of the... F oh, okay. <clears throat> What do you mean? Where is the parent-child analogy in Genesis 4? Okay, Genesis 4 begins with two children. They're now adults. They can't get along and resolve issues. Okay, so one of them kills the other one. If you've ever raised children, you've certainly seen this scenario before. Hopefully not one of them killing, <clears throat> excuse me, the other one, but certainly uh, children who can't get along. Now, the rest of 4 through 6 is the story of the first civilization, and it's told in terms of the family of Cain, versus the family which is called the sons of God or the family of Seth. It's all about families governing or rather failing to govern. Okay, so 
let's get back to it and that'll probably be the last sidetrack let's look at child rearing from the perspective of the fall and then from the perspective of the incarnation the cross and Pentecost that is we will look at it as Christians in a still fallen world who who are overcoming that world as promised but still not completely free of death we'll just call this by the time I get to see the whole book who knows what chapter it'll be but we'll just call it chapter three the power of ethical service or love your child no doubt that'll change too but it's a working title up until now civilization is the story of children walking the earth guided by a few father leaders so to get a handle on this let's ask what is childhood what is and what what society is our physical existence is not primarily found in any natural habitat. To the extent anthropologists have found any remains that they could say these are human remains from 100 million years ago. Whatever the remains are, whatever the dating, the way you know they are human remains is they're always found in distinctly unnatural ways. The ways humans have reshaped the physical world around them to fit their vision for how things ought to be is what it is to be a human. They're creative. That's how we know it's human remains and not just some baboon tribe out there. Now the dating of it I'm not going to go into, but I will say this. There are no human remains that do not have this characteristic of the reshaping of the world to fit the way those humans thought it ought to be. People don't live in natural habitats that are modified by instinct, such as an animal's lair or nest or burrow or an anthill or a beehive. Humans run in groups that can be compared socially to an insect colony or a pack of predators or a herd of herbivores. Similarly, clothes, uh, their similarity <clears throat> to the animals is the similarity clothes have to fur. There's sort of a functional identity there. But beyond only the most surface of similarities, an organized group, for instance, there is very little comparison between animals and humans. Animals can only do their one habitat thing. It's not a choice. Build a nest, uh, bring stuff into a cave to make it more whatever. It's not a choice. It's what animals do. Humans design and create their habitat in their heads and in their hearts, and then they carve them out of what the world at hand has as far as they know how to use it. We've come so far in this process, you're actually sitting watching me online while I drink my coffee on an amazing device and eat. What these are, these are really, we're having communion here. These are the elements of the modern church. You can't have church without coffee and donuts. Well, we don't believe in donuts, we're and cooks. What you're seeing here is um, a when Ann makes one of her cakes, I can't do pictures because I don't have the technology, she has to trim the cake and when she's done, she has this pile of the most amazing cake you've ever eaten. She despises boxes. So she has this pile of cake stuff and now that I'm trying to do this keto thing, I'm not very good at the keto thing by the way, but I can't eat the stuff anymore. However, for the sacramental purposes of joining with you, I will eat my coffee and my cake and we shall have fellowship such as the amazing mind of man can design it. Okay, humans create, design and create their habitats in their heads and in their hearts and then they carve those habitats out of what the world at hand, has at hand to the best they know how to use it. People decorate their space with symbolic and practical objects. They artificially heat them. They light them, and as soon as they could figure out how to, they artificially cool them. They keep the rain out of their living space, and they figure out how to keep smoke out of it, too, as much as they can. No need to go further into this. It's obvious. There's, what it means to be human is you create your space, and you decorate it. The human habitat goes far beyond housing and eating, however. It's rooted in our social order. People live in groups that cooperate with each other. The cooperation is based on who each person thinks they are, individually, and who each person thinks that the people around him are, and, this is very important, what they think the rules are that we should follow with each other. I could add to that that there's also in our minds people who are kind of in charge of us, and we do want to know what they think of us, and we want to be careful what we think of them, 
because they sort of enforce the rules that govern our social behavior and they enforce them from the outside. Now, the human habitat is an amazingly rich multidimensional psychological and social tapestry out of which all labor is divided up and each person trades with the other person so that each person can get what they need, giving up what they think they do not need as much. That's the basis of all wealth. Free trade always leads to each side of the trade having more than they had before, even though the, everything there is the same. Because what they now have is something they, they believe enriches them. They can do something with it they, that they couldn't do without it, more than, the, than the, what they could do for what they traded it for it. Now, the first recorded word of God spoken to our very first parents to define their purpose in life was precisely about this economy. Remember the first words? Correct. Be fruitful. Exchange is the heart of fruitfulness, whether you're talking about sex or whether you're talking about the most complicated algorithm on Wall Street or just what two people out in the boonies somewhere tr trade with each other. I want this rock. You want that stick. Whatever. Isolation is not only not good, it was the first bad thing mentioned in the Bible. It is the essence of fruitlessness, sterility, emptiness. It is the first thing God addresses after creating the male, man. It is a sign that something is wrong. Something needs fixing. Someone needs fellowship, cooperation, exchange. Someone who can create things you can't, and someone for whom you can create what they cannot. And then you exchange the things that are not as important to you for the things that are more important. You need those other people. You were never designed to be in isolation. Economics is at the heart of what it means to be a person. Not just the mathematical analysis of financial exchange patterns, but the home of what it means to be human in, spiritual, moral, psychological, and social, social fellowship with others. That's where home is. All of these activities require tools, psychological tools, analytical tools, communication tools, understanding tools, ethical tools. I'm not sure ethics is a tool, but it can be viewed that way. All of the ways we are able to fruitfully interact with each other are the tools of being human. Those who use these tools well are called wise, and those who to use them poorly are called fools. You might say that those who chew with their mouth open, using their tools wrongly, are called rude. But those who use them to damage others are called immoral or evil or sinners. Every culture and every social group understands these distinctions. That's because they're human. They're, they're built into us. They're actually the closest thing we have to, to instincts. Raising children is simply teaching them the tools of creating their habitat with and in the midst of others. We first build for our children, requiring them to use our tools as best they can as they get older too. In the process, we teach them how to build their own world-building tools themselves. We teach them what their heart and soul must be. For lack of better words, I'll call them our psychological and spiritual workshop. We teach them what sort of person they should be because it is that person who will create not just their world, but the tools they have. To, de to determine how, I don't want to say how good, but how effective, pick a word that, that works, to build a world that works. In many r r respects, their world is private and it is theirs alone. And in many other respects, it's shared and all others have an interest in it. In fact, the fascinating things about these worlds is historically, literally, certainly if you're a Christian, from the beginning of creation until now, Everything that has gone on has impacted who and what you are. Because of the fall into sin, by the way, what that means is that history is important and learning it is important. It's not just some fact back there, but being able to teach how, how you got, hey kid, how you got to be where you are, if you can communicate that as a parent, that will do more to giving you a, a child who, when they become an adult, 
will transform all he touches. It's one of the great failures. You want to know why sex ed is a failure? Because we stopped teaching covenant history and just taught sex as something that is done, something holy, sacred, something for fun. Who knows what we taught about it? But you take sex out of the context of be fruitful, okay? out of the context of trading, communicating with each other, out of the context of the moral surrounding of who we are as people and the fact that you are the first generation of the rest of history. We take that out of it and just teach them the mechanics of anything. And we're literally cutting the roots off the tree of our child, sticking the stick in the ground and saying, hey, grow. Some do, some don't, but they're always twisted. Anyway, that is the fascinating thing about who and what we are is that we're historical beings. And as a Christian, you already are in touch with that whole history. Why do you want to be ignorant about it? It makes no sense to me. Why be ignorant? Why raise your children to be ignorant about it? Why turn your children over those who rewrite history to teach them that they have no significance? I don't get it, but Christians do this all the time. <clears throat> so what we do is we teach them the tools to communicate their world to others in a healthy and constructive way to build their private world in a social world of a common understanding with others. Because of the fall into sin, we also have to teach them how to protect themselves for the destructive things that others will do to them and the destructive things their own decisions can bring to themselves and others. Now, mind you, I said because they're fallen to sin. Actually, if there were no sin whatsoever in the world, those things would still need to be taught. It was the failure to understand those things on the part of Adam and Eve that got them into the problem because there were very destructive uh, results of decisions they could make and there were people that were out to destroy them with those destructive decisions. And that's what the first story is about. So this isn't just a result of the fall. Knowing how to protect yourself from death is built in. A lot of people don't get this, but, but death, the death penalty, is the very first promise found in the Bible. God makes all this stuff, does all this stuff, talks about all this stuff, and then he makes his first promise. The day you eat of this, you will die. Okay, so, so the death penalty is not just something out here that came upon it as, as, as a result of, of our fall into sin and now death enters the world and all of that. The death penalty, the potential for death, was right there in the world from the beginning. And I'm not getting into the whole debate of when death and decay entered. Um, I'm just simply saying that, that whenever that point was, death was promised for those who rebel against God. Now, so... We teach our children how to protect themselves from the destructive thing that others will do to them and the destructive things their own decisions can bring to themselves and others. Decisions have consequences. All social systems are, sh are a shared understanding of the necessity of ethics, that is right and wrong, of doing good, not doing evil, and of punishing evil. All those three things go together. People may disagree on the details but human social order is not based on instinct. It is based on an amazingly small set of simple, obvious moral laws. Now, I call them laws because with them, society is made possible, as with physical laws. If I will go into the analogy, you get it. Uh, without them, society, that is organizing ourselves, working with other people, is literally impossible. Now, I'm going to discuss this fact more in a later chapter because uh, they're essential to grow beyond children walking the earth into adults and are taking, excuse me, I'm going to discuss them more in a later chapter because God's laws for society are essential to grow beyond children walking the earth into adults taking dominion into the earth. You might say the entire growth into adult process was short-circuited when Adam and Eve simply refuse to understand or to gain the knowledge of the distinction between good and evil from obedience rather than disobedience. Okay, so they were, in a sense, doomed to be children until something could be done about that basic, that, that basic moral failure. That's a lot of my thesis. So whatever form these moral laws are communicated in, they will determine the long-term success or failure of what the child does with his adult life and what the society is able to accomplish with its adult members and why all of history up until Jesus Christ changed everything, all of history is the story of children walking the earth 
trying to figure it out for themselves. All of history is, in a sense, in one way, this isn't a total analogy, uh, like that book, Lord of the Flies. A bunch of kids on a desert island trying to figure out how things work. Now, the shape of all human reality, reality is inescapably moral. All we do cannot escape that fundamental structure even before we ask, does it work? Something we want to do, does it work? We ask, is it right? Is it wrong? Should it exist? Should it be used this way or should it be used that way? Should it not be used this way? See, working with physical realities always depends on it working for the right ethical purpose, never merely on just it working. Without sound ethics, that is without sound applied moral laws, no human individual or society is sustainable. Ethics and just judgment on the part of each individual are the foundation of sustainable people and sustainable social orders, and social orders can't be sustained further than people are able to control their own lives and hearts. So, now we come to child rearing. The parents' goal is to teach their incompetent children how to be competent, that is, how to build their world, their habitat, their society, their heart, in a way that really works, is sustainable, is just, is true. So then the child, now an adult, can go out and build their own sustainable world and be part of a sustainable social order. So how does a person get from a complete, utter helplessness on the one hand, the, the fertilized egg, produced by the most fundamental of human economic exchanges? How do they get from there to the point where they're able to be considered adults and to be able to, to do all this stuff I've just been talking about? Well, people raise their children. It takes time. The process is designed to do more than demonstrate how their instincts work. It is designed to create something we now call society, but it is the tools of humanity with which they create their world. Raising children is obviously the most invasive human project that human beings ever embark on. This is one of the reasons elitists love the analogy of I'm the father, you're the child. It gives them authority to invade their children and hold those children in perpetual childhood while they reshape their heart and soul and minds to make it a better world while they create the new man. That is what elitists do. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, you thought I was talking about elitist rulers of society? <laughs> well, it is true of those elitist rulers of society, true. But I was also talking primarily about elitist parents and elitist parenting theorists. You will find them in surprising places doing seemingly opposite things very often in the name of the living God and the name of the Bible. But they are elitist to the core. They, in one way or another, view their power over their children as being God-given, eternal, and their children always being bound to be their subjects. Even when that is not explicit, they will produce as their ideal codependent children. They will call it honoring their parents. Sometimes it works. Sometimes it works for a while, but in the end, it's death. Because God's word is death to all elitists, all people who believe that who and what you are, your, your being is fixed, and it forever gives you the right to invade and control people, or it forever gives you the right to, excuse me, to, not right, but the obligation to be invaded and controlled by those who know more than you do. And it's not simply the governments of the world that do that. Very often we find it right there in the home. The invasion now in, real, in, in a real family is justified for two reasons. The first reason is, but by the way, now that I've said all that about it, elitist parents, I'm not saying that the, in, that the child is on his own perfectly okay and needs no invasion. The incompetent do need invasion, but it's a particular kind of one. First of all, they, they, children really do, are incompetent. They can't take care of themselves, either to provide for their own needs or to protect themselves against dangers. Uh, in, in one sense, they're too weak to protect themselves against dangers. In another sense, they're too inexperienced to even know there's a danger out there. They'll just pick that poison up and drink it or give it to a brother or sister to drink or spray it in their eyes or, or run out into the street. In other words, they're, they don't get it. The second reason why being invasive as a parent is justified 
is because developing the heart or soul, spirit or mind is the most invasive thing that any human being could do to another. And so it's permitted to be done in a limited way for a limited amount of time. If you can't, within a brief period of years, figured out how to nurture that, that heart and soul of a child into a positive direction to the way he should go, then you lose your chance. It's over. You're done. If you can, then when you're done, wonderful things happen. If you fail in that process, terrible things happen. And it's why parents are given a limited permission to attempt in limited ways with their children. And the limitation has it is there's a limitations of wisdom, there's a limitations of physical force. You can do things that hurt them, you can do things that hurt their hearts, and you can address in them and saying, why do you have that attitude? Why do you have that thought? It's limited. The reason it requires wisdom is the child from the earliest age, and if you've ever raised children, you've seen this. The child from an earliest age has a sense of who they are and why they're there. They're not sure of what it is, they don't get it all, but they also know that when somebody else tries to get inside that, if they don't trust that person, it is an incredibly damaging effort. If I could just in a nutshell say the problem with so many liberal, modern, elitist attempts is they either leave all that alone, say it's none of your business, he's already fully mature, or they, they, they give you the tools to try and destroy your kid from the inside out, all in the name of helping him because you have the right to, to invade in there. But as I've said, it is necessary for those areas to be addressed. It is necessary uh, to recognize serious limitations in how we address them. And the children really are incompetent to take care of themselves and they're just developing. Their, their who and what they are isn't, isn't all there yet. And you're there as the parent on that holy ground. And the reason you as a parent are trusted is because you are the most likely person in all of creation, in the created order, who will take seriously the holy ground upon which you are standing and take your shoes off and realize where you are. You're the most likely person to do that. Every time any group for any reason, we think of the nanny state, well that comes from the wealthy used to get nannies to do this job for them. Anytime you farm this job out to somebody other than the parents, there will be a price to pay because only the parents as a group are the most, are the most likely to do the right things more often. As a, as a parent of eight, I have to say do the right things more often. That's very optimistic. But this is why parenting requires wisdom, and good parents are called wise. If for no other reason, then, they were good at parenting. It is one of the proofs of being fit to lead in the church. The elder's got to show that he's done a good job with his family. But the wisdom here is not some Superman PhD wisdom and knowledge that just listen to me and I'll give you all the tricks of the trade and you can go out there and insert tab A of your ch child into slot B and it'll all work. God, nowhere in the Bible gives you that kind of information. God gives the most, what he does though is this, God gives the most basic cookies and he puts them on the lowest shelf so that anyone can take hold of the tools of authoritarian coercion, the rod, and your natural God-given inclinations, and with those tools clearly communicate to your children what does and does not work for adults. It can be done in Christian families, it can be done in the most distant uh, tribal situations on the planet. It's what parents do. It is simple. If the, now, if the rod of correction is all you have to use, then to spare the rod means you leave the child to grow up in an illusion, the illusion that the world will not kill him if he does anything he wants. Very few parents, unless they've been badly informed, <clears throat> by experts leave their child to grow up with the illusion that the world will not kill him if he does anything he, he, he wants. Unfortunately, we are living in America, which is, is a tiny corner of the world, but we're living in America 
where precisely this illusion has been inculcated that you can do anything you want, you can be anything you could be. And it's taking that, that incredible truth from Genesis 1. Be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, rule over it. I've made you in my image. Go forth and do it. It's taking that incredible truth that, that Adam and Eve sitting there, even today, we don't have a clue everything that can be done to fulfill that. <clears throat> but on the other hand, they take that and then they, they secularize it. They turn it as if this is a, a toy in their control and they tell people, apart from God's law, that anything they want, they can do. So the, the kid grows up in the illusion that the world will not kill him if he does anything he wants. That's very different. That's very different from Genesis 1, though the Christians fall into that. Now, the rod of correction and the authority to use it puts child raising on the simplest shelf there is. Anyone who is an adult able to care for themselves has the simple ability or the simplest of tools to train their child in the basics of adult responsibility. There are many people perfectly capable of raising their children. It seems harsh to the more delicately refined like us, but it's not going to kill the child. They don't need PhDs in child psychology to do it or the analytical tools of an ethicist. It may be that with some of those tools you could do better, but the point is God designed it so that even with the fall, even with everything broken down as it is, the simplest functioning adult has the following things. They'll have a strong sense that there is a right and wrong, and they'll have a pretty good idea of what they think it is. They're, the second thing they'll have is a desire that their children end up better off than they are. Now, you may say we were born, in this case, post-millennial. That is, desiring a fulfilling conclusion to it all that is better off than where we started. And parents hold that for their children. If not before Christ, certainly everywhere where the gospel has penetrated a culture. The other thing parents have held everywhere is an unreasoning affection for their child. They just have it. You know, I hate to say this, you look at the ugliest kid out there, and I'm not saying anybody has an ugly kid, I'm just saying the ugliest kid out there, the mom just thinks that they've, they'll be, be a walking the runway at a, at a Gucci show. They love their child. There's just this unreasoning affection for their child, like a father pities his son. There's also a measure of empathy. They can feel for their child. Things happen to their kid and they unreasonably will fly into a rage or have their chest puff out in pride. There's this empathy. They, they, to a certain extent, they live their life through the, the experiences of their child. We all have this as parents. And then the fifth thing is, there's a strong sense that there are some things that get you hated and can get you killed. You don't want to do those things. You want to stay away from that area. There's some things that get you loved and make you successful. There's a lot of conflict in all this, but there is that sense that there's a right and wrong, and there's consequences of that right and wrong. Now, if humans have something that could be called instinctive or instincts, those would be as close as we get to them. Not specific behaviors, but specific senses to guide a range of behaviors. Those and a rod are all anyone needs to produce a functional, moral, and even fulfilled adult. And the reason I start with this is because, now I won't tell you why I start with this, I just did. You'll find out later. Now, what is sad is that when a progressive world, now, and I'm talking about Christian conservatives and, Christ, and pagan liberals, Christian liberals, when a progressive world takes this rod of correction away because they think people are too dumb to use it without hurting their kids. Those most damaged by this misplaced compassion are the simple. And, and I don't mean the stupid. I mean simple in the concept of that Quaker song. Tis a gift to be simple, tis a gift to be free. That song. There's a gift in simplicity. Or Paul referred to him a different way. The people that, that this taking away the rod because we think they're too simple, stupid, too, they, they're least esteemed. Paul called them least esteemed, esteemed. And what he said is that they're the least esteemed among us. And what he told the Corinthians is, these least esteemed among them, and by the way, we all know who they are. Everybody in every social group knows the one who has the sign on his back that says, kick me, I'm an idiot. The least esteemed among us 
Paul told the Corinthians would be competent to judge angels and any conflict also between believers. And then he trashed on them for going to pagan judges instead of even going to the simplest, least esteemed Christian who would be a better judge. What Christian and liberal progressives do is they leave no tools to raise their children to these people, to anyone without advanced degrees. Now, in the beginning, we think it's just them over there, and we all know people that we think are too stupid to raise their kids. <clears throat> what you don't realize is the elitist looks at you and says, you're too stupid to raise your kids. And you know what? You leave your kids in public school, and then your kids come along, and guess what? They've been taught one thing. Parents are incompetent to raise their children. Guess who the parent is now? Your kids. See, the elitist wants to create a world in which everybody, not just the simple, is convinced that without the advanced degrees, without the expertise, you can't raise kids effectively. The result is not kids raised with wisdom or kids raised to, to have the joy of never having to be hit or something like that, or being taught violence through being hit. What actually comes about of this is kids raised with no direction because for the simple, like you, they're not, you're not capable of all the fancy stuff the worldly wise thinks is indispensable to live a full life and a pleasing life and a pleasant life, the good life. And therefore, you're not permitted to use the God-given morality, which you know is there, the love, the hope for the future that God has equipped you with, just as much as a simple person, for the most important task of all, namely sending forth the next generation. He gave that to every human being who's a parent so that life could continue. All progressives are elitists. Doesn't matter if you're a Christian progressive or if you're a Christian fundamentalist progressive, you're an elitist. It is intrinsic to their nature. And nothing I say here is in any way anything but trying to wipe clean the spit they have vomited on the face of God's little ones. Many of your faces have been vomited onto, and we need to clean that off. Because <sighs> they've convinced you that you don't have the tools to care for yourself, and you don't have the tools to care for your children. And that, that your children are nothing but incompetent children. In fact, you are incompetent to use the tools that God's given you to raise your own children, simply because you lack advanced degrees in analytical skills. Now, they don't do all this by insulting you. They do all this by insulting that group over there. Those are the ones they insult, but you're the target. And if you don't have it yet, your kids will if you leave them in their culture. Then after spitting on who and what you are before God, then they remove the tools that God has given you, such as the rod, such as the conviction that there's a right and a wrong worth passing on, such that you are somebody who can pass that conviction on, they, such as the belief that, they, that you can guide your children at all. They remove these things, and then when they see people floundering and failing, see, they, they, seeing this, the elitist Christians, the pagan progressives, proclaim the proof that they were right all along. See, most people really do need our government, our schools, our armies, our churches, our police, our welfare, our health care, our jails, our regulations, our pastors, our elders, to protect and provide for them. See, this, this, this proves it. You're just incompetent. Now, having said this, the rod and our natural understanding of the world are not all God has given us to raise our children. I'm just saying those cookies are on the lowest shelf so that the human race can continue, and it's in the hands of anybody for it to continue. These things are merely sufficient. What, after our fall into sin at the very beginning, were given to all of us. But God has given us much more wisdom and it's found in the unfolding of the central doctrines of the faith. The doctrine of the incarnation, God became flesh and dwelt among us. The atonement, God on the cross, made it possible for us to be like him, and it began to transform our hearts. In the filling with the Holy Spirit, at Pentecost, he came to live in his people. These things transform the possibilities you have to be able to raise your children with those tools that God has given you, but now do it in a way that, that begins to teach them 
how to be self-governed adults in the kingdom of God with direct access to God, his law, and a transformed heart. And so <clears throat> the elitist wants to control others. The elitist parent, Christian and otherwise, will quickly grasp the control dimension of childhood, whether they're a leader in the world or whether they're just trying to raise their kids. But they'll control it in a way that freezes the child into perpetual childhood. You know, the use of the rod doesn't make a child a perpetual child. The use of wisdom doesn't let the child do anything that he wants. Here's what's going to happen. Becoming an adult is inevitable. The only question is, will you have a mutual adult relationship with your parents or will their elitist control either drive you to submissive dependence or drive you away or drive you to spend the rest of your life trying to dominate them and everything else you run into? That's not dominion, by the way. That's domination. Anybody who doesn't know the, the difference between dominion and domination needs to check up dominatrix on your, just Google dominatrix and you'll see what I'm talking about. The true power of God is found in how to raise children, not in the debate over the use of force in raising them. As long as we live in a sinful world, force must be an option. In fact, even if we didn't live in a sinful world, force could well be an option. Even if it's seldom used, or used as much as the fool needs it. But God has provided us with so much more in Christ Jesus. And I guess it's that more that we're going to look at the next time I talk about this, because I'm going to try to unpack built on that foundation of, of how God coming in the flesh, how dying on a cross for your sins to transform your heart, and how coming to live in you changes the whole possibility of where child rearing can go. But it does not take the cookies off the bottom shelf as if somehow somebody who simply does what's in their hands to do, what God has placed in their heart to do, is inadequate, inefficient, wrong, harmful, and so forth. God has a way of building on the, thing, on the tools that he gives us to get us to go further up and further in, higher and better, not in such a way that we look back and say, huh, I have no need of you. Thank you for listening to this episode of No Neutrality on the Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network. Don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to download your favorite audiobooks and podcasts. And if you are a Christian Reconstructionist blogger and you'd like to contribute your blogs into this audio blog format, click on the volunteer link on our website, send us an email, and let us know you'd like to join the team. May Christ be glorified and His kingdom extended from sea to sea and from the rivers to the ends of the earth. The Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network brings to you a complete lineup of podcasts where you will hear practical and tactical theology. Our desire is not simply that you consume our shows, but that you also live out your faith in every area of life. We can talk all day long about these things, but if we fail to put them into practice, then we fail as ambassadors of Jesus Christ our King. Subscribe now to your favorite Reconstructionist Radio Podcast Network shows. Or you can subscribe to the Reconstructionist Radio Master Feed, where all of the content we produce, including the audiobooks and audio articles, will pop up as soon as they are available. And don't forget to visit ReconstructionistRadio.com to volunteer as a narrator or to partner with this ministry financially. May the Holy Spirit stir you into action for Christ and His kingdom.